Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, ask you some questions about the glioma itself, because it's not a very known cancer by general population, right? So, um, yeah. well, first of all, if you can pronounce your name so that I won't say it incorrectly, how do you pronounce your name? Antonio Iavarone. Iavarone. What's your formation? You are a biologist, a doctor, what do you My... No, no, I am a, my background is that of a pediatric oncologist, uh -huh. pediatric oncologist. So uh -huh. uh, my, uh, my background is uh, that of a, um, of a pediatrician who was uh, treating uh, primarily children with brain tumors. The reason is that brain tumors is actually the first cause of death for cancer in children. Oh, but then you, you move it to other brain tumors in adults as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, uh, these tumors, you were saying they are not uh, so well appreciated by the public because, of course, the incidence is not uh, as high as other type of more frequent tumors such as breast cancer, lung cancer, uh, but uh, uh, these are actually tumors that uh, occur at any age. So uh, you can have brain tumors in children, in young adults, in adolescents, you can have brain tumors in normal adults, and you can have brain tumors also at, in old people, in um, elderly. So this is a, a disease that doesn't spare any age. It can happen at any time of and the is, life. Is it a more aggressive cancer than the others? Yes, unfortunately, yes. Uh, brain tumors, malignant brain tumors, like the one we have been studying, that is the the most frequent type of brain tumors um, is called the glioma, uh, is uh, a, a typically a lethal tumor for which uh, uh, in the last few years uh, there have been very few positive developments. While uh, for other tumor types uh, like prostate cancer or breast cancer, uh, um, uh, there are major uh, changes in the, in the therapeutic management of patients and, uh, you know, there has been a major success of how these patients uh, now are cured many times. Uh, for malignant brain tumors, uh, this has not been the case. And, uh, you know, initially this was because there was very little research actually done on them. But now in the very recent years, in the last uh, three or four years, really, the community, the community of scientists who has uh, worked uh, and continues to work very aggressively on brain tumors has uh, dramatically expanded. There are many more studies now because uh, everybody recognizes uh, malignant brain tumors as a major unmet challenge in clinical oncology. Probably similar to malignant glioma, there is really only pancreatic cancer as a major tumor that uh, is uh, still fundamentally incurable. So we have definitely a, a lot of progress that needs to be made in order to improve the clinical outcome of these patients. Why was it neglected before? By the, of the reason it is still quite neglected is that, of course, uh, primarily the financial resources supporting research have been uh, and are still primarily directed towards other tumor types, you know? I mean, uh, uh, Tumors like breast cancer, you know, clearly are uh, absorbing the vast majority of resources. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the progress in science and uh, in the clinical setting, of course, in our ability to cure patients 
is directly proportional to the amount of uh, resources that we have available. There are many types of uh, possible uh, uh, life-saving experiments that could be done and that uh, uh, sometimes are not done because we simply don't have the money to do it. So the situation hasn't really changed, I should say, from that standpoint. I mean, the financial resources are still quite limited, <clears throat> again, compared to other tumors, and that remains a problem. So, I mean, uh, uh, typically uh, in this field, in this uh, philanthropic field, usually is uh, the presence of uh, some symbolic figure that makes a change. So you may recall that uh, uh, actually uh, Ted Kennedy, I don't know if you remember, the brother of uh, the uh, old president of the United mm -hmm. States, of uh, John Kennedy, yes. actually died of a brain tumor. Mm. Um, also recently, the son of uh, uh, Joe Biden, the vice president of the United States, uh, died of a brain tumor. And, uh, you know, he was obviously a very young guy, I mean, um, around uh, probably 30 or 40 years old. Wow. So brain tumors in that age, in the age of young adult, is uh, probably the first cause of tumors in humans. So in the age of between 20 and 30 years, you know, very few people, of course, get cancer at that age, and brain tumors is one of the most frequent because brain tumors is typical in every age. So, um, uh, you know, while it is not as frequent as the other tumors, uh, what makes the difference is that the other tumors can be cured. Malignant brain tumors cannot be cured, at least the majority of them. Is it more dif difficult to treat a tumor inside the brain than in all oh, the yes. parts of the body? Very much. Absolutely. Uh, obviously, you are a very smart person and you recognize exactly one of the main challenges. There are several problems with uh, why brain tumors cannot be cured and certainly the particular location in the brain is one of the most important reasons. Um, in the brain, uh, we have uh, <clears throat> a structure which is called the blood-brain barrier, which normally functions to prevent the penetration inside of the brain of many toxic substances that can be present in the blood. The brain needs to be preserved. It's a very important uh, organ, so this structure is very important to retain uh, the structure of the brain isolated from the rest of the body. However, this works to our disadvantage if now we need to uh, give drugs, administer drugs, that need to reach the brain tumors because, uh, of course, because of the blood-brain barrier now, this will not penetrate the brain tumors. And this is one of the reasons why uh, the same tumor, if it's localized in a different tissue, can be treated sometimes, whereas if it's inside of the brain, it's much more difficult to treat because you simply cannot uh, provide the concentration of drugs that are required to kill the tumor cells. So this is a definitely a major challenge uh, for any therapy with brain tumors. The other challenge is the lack of so-called effective targets. Uh, right now, we in the United States, but many other people around the world, are very excited about uh, uh, something that is called the precision medicine or personalized medicine. I don't know if you heard about this. Basically, the idea here is that you can study at the molecular level the tumor of any single patient and uh, target them with very uh, highly specific drugs the uh, molecular alterations that are responsible for the growth of that patient tumor, only that patient tumor. 
Uh, for malignant brain tumors, uh, this uh, is not worked so far. And uh, um, beside the, the lack of penetration of the drug, that is uh, clearly a major problem, is also probably the fact that we don't have very effective uh, targets, targets that are really important for the growth of the brain tumor. So that now if you inhibit them, uh, the tumor stops growing. Uh, this has happened for other tumors, but not for malignant brain tumors. Or if it is present, is present only in a small fraction of tumors, only in a very small fraction of tumors. And that's actually what our group now is trying to, to do, to go after those uh, uh, small group of tumors that have the same type of molecular targets that can be um, engaged by a specific drug. I don't know if this point is clear, but uh, this is clearly the basis for the personalized therapy that is, uh, you know, what we all hope to achieve in the next future. You said you don't have the molecular targets to, to bring to me because, but it, it is because you don't know yet or because brain tumor doesn't have it in general? <clears throat> they have a molecular alterations and that's actually, you know, the main purpose of this paper. You know, this paper with uh, Wutan and with Royal Verac is a paper that reports all of the possible molecular alterations in a very large data set of brain tumors. The problem is that most of these molecular alterations don't work in isolation. They work together. In one tumor, you have many molecular alterations all together. So now, if you have a drug that will hit one particular molecular alteration is not sufficient because the tumor has many others that will uh, uh, be able to overcome the inhibition of that single molecular alteration. Another reason why this happens is because we have what is called uh, molecular heterogeneity. Each tumor cell is different. So not only uh, you have uh, one patient that is different from another, Hello? Hello, hello. I think the call has failed. You were saying that yeah. the, besides the, the, there are several molecular paths at the same time, can you? Yeah, now we are going. You also yeah. have heterogenic alterations. You are saying something about that. Exactly. Inside of the tumor. So you have that uh, some cells inside of the tumor have one alteration. Another cell in the same tumor, in fact, very close to the first cell, has a different alteration. So there are many alterations inside of the tumor. Then we don't is know it, which one is really important. Is it a characteristic from glioma or from all cancers? Is it a characteristic of the worst type of cancer? I mean, the, the, the tumors that today cannot be cured have these particular features, have this uh, issue of a tumor heterogeneity. So it happens in other tumors. So typically, it happens when tumors uh, uh, become, uh, for example, resistant to therapy. Initially, may, they may respond to therapy, but then they don't respond anymore. And the, the reason why they don't respond anymore is because they acquire this uh, heterogeneity. The, the status of the tumor change all the time. So you have heterogeneity uh, inside of the tumor, geographical heterogeneity, but you also have a time-dependent heterogeneity. That means that the tumor was characterized by some alterations initially, but then those alterations change with time. The tumors adapt, they change. They are able to escape the therapy with new alterations. That's terrible. <laughs> That's why we have to fight. The fight 
it's hard. So sure. talk, talking about uh, specifically this study, uh, you use it. <laughs> We usually we are used to look at the genes itself, but you also look at something beyond the genes. I would like you to explain what is this epigenetic features that yeah. you look at that. So first of all, this study has really been, I think, a paradigm of how you know these big studies should be conducted. I mean. I don't know if you know about the TCGA uh, network is uh, something that has uh, now been going on for a long time and uh, um, typically has involved many different investigators around the world. But uh, I think that this particular study has really tried to set the stage for some something very different because uh, each uh, group, uh, each of the main group, of course, uh, that participated in the study has uh, contributed uh, uh, a very specific uh, expertise that has been uh, integrated with the expertise of the other group. So this has uh, really been a true multidisciplinary study. So the epigenetic work uh, is uh, uh, what uh, has been integrated now in the classification of, uh, um, of these uh, tumors. And uh, uh, epigenetics uh, me really means uh, uh, the type of alterations that uh, are not uh, uh, changing the genetic status of the tumor. They don't change the status of the DNA, the permanent DNA uh, condition that uh, is uh, characterized by the sequence of the base. Uh, so uh, epigenetics uh, is, uh, is a big word that includes many different types of features, uh, <clears throat> typically DNA methylation, but also other type of features like chromatin modifier, chromatin modification. And uh, now we know that using this uh, epigenetic information, we can actually identify different subgroups of brain tumors that had never been uh, recognized before. So the identification of these subgroups is very important because by identifying them, we can understand much better the prognosis, the clinical outcome of those patients. Uh, before this work, uh, some big group of patients uh, were associated with a particular prognosis. Now we know that that's not true, that we need to look more carefully within those groups to identify uh, what is the true uh, significance of the clinical outcome for those patients. So let's talk, uh, you have been practicing medicine for how long? Me? Yeah. Oh, very long time. <laughs> so I can the beginning when I mean I am not really sure. I got my MD degree in 1987 in Rome, Italy, at so, the Catholic University of Rome. So I assume you are uh, practicing medicine before, even before the genetic uh, oh. exams appeared. So yeah. what did you know before genetic information and what changes after you can do this genetic and epigenetic studies? Everything, of course. I mean, before, uh, when I was uh, only trying to treat children, uh, trying uh, unsuccessfully, of course, uh, to treat children with brain tumors, we really could couldn't do anything. I mean, and there was this idea that somehow research in the future would change things, but we really didn't know how this would happen. Um, now we can determine all if there are the sufficient resources. So again, this is a theoretical statement of mine, because in reality it almost never happens. Uh, but we can determine all the possible uh, genetic, uh, epigenetic, and all the other, because there are many other molecular features uh, of a particular patient uh, with uh, a brain tumor, with a malignant brain tumor. So, um, because, uh, as I said, that both the genetic and now we know the epigenetic alterations change from patient to patient, uh, 
Um, it's very difficult to predict before we can do this analysis uh, what is exactly the status of that patient tumor. You can only know if you can do, uh, if you're able to do, um, very sophisticated molecular studies like those that we now publish in this paper. Uh, this type of approach uh, that could potentially be used uh, uh, immediately for any patient with brain tumor, unfortunately, is uh, almost never done. Because uh, what happens is that uh, um, this type of information that we have been able to generate, um, of course, require a lot of resources. Uh, financial resources and uh, require a lot of uh, expertise uh, in terms of uh, scientists like us uh, who work together. What we did for this paper was uh, to make a discovery of, of uh, uh, these uh, epigenetic and genetic alterations. But our purpose was not to treat patients, of course. We were not doing this because we had this one, two or 100 patients who were waiting to know what are my alterations so that I can understand what is the best therapy. That's not what our goal was. And that's unfortunate because it should be the goal of scientists like us to contribute to the cure of patients. This is possible. But unfortunately, we need a different type of infrastructure, financially and organizational infrastructure, to uh, direct our research towards that goal. But before you can treat a patient and diagnose it, it really correctly, you had to do this study to know the para parameters, didn't you? This is not what is done routinely. The type of studies we have done is never done for uh, individual patients. At the level, at the depth that we have done is never done. Because what we have been able to do is to use uh, uh, data that have been generated uh, by this uh, network, which is uh, the TCGA. What the TCGA did uh, is uh, to uh, um, use uh, actually a lot of money to generate uh, a large amount of data for any single patient. Uh, I don't know the cost, but probably is uh, over $50,000. I don't know, because uh, uh, there are many uh, molecular analysis that have been generated. Then what we did, uh, what our group did, is to take uh, all of these analysis and analyze them to understand what is the epigenetic landscape, what is the genetic alteration present in these tumors. As a whole, we studied over 1,000 tumors. Again, the scope of our work was not to provide therapeutic uh, suggestion to individual patients. That is what our study uh, makes uh, possible if uh, this is done with that aim, but this is not something that today is done any, anywhere in the world. Mainly because of resources that are not available or even equipment, that, uh, the structure that is not available in hospitals and clinics around the world. Mainly because no hospital in the world has decided to invest uh, resources towards this goal. Uh, basically, what happens is that this work is done by scientists, uh, not by clinicians. Clinicians, uh, uh, the people who are in the clinic uh, who treat the patients, uh, uh, they typically don't understand all uh, these type of uh, features. And uh, uh, it's very difficult to, to engage, uh, you, you know, the clinical setting uh, with uh, uh, the type of understanding and uh, background that re is required to put together all of this data. I should say that, of course, uh, it's not that, uh, you know, if you do this, now you cure all the patients. Of course, that's not true. 
but uh, clearly uh, this uh, type of work uh, is the basis to bring a new uh, hope to patients. I mean, one thing that will certainly happen, as I said, after this paper is published, is, is that we will know much better uh, what is uh, the uh, epigenetic and genetic features of a small group of patients that before had not been recognized, that we didn't know they were characterized by those particular type of alterations and by that particular type of clinical outcome or prognosis. Uh, can you please change your, uh, the, my point of view of you, please, to put it, oh. you don't have to be closer, but if you can change your, your screen like this. Oh, again, like this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think okay. it will be, yeah. Yeah, now you're yeah. closer to me, great. Yeah. <laughs> so, if, as you have already entered the, the results of the study, I would like to, to you to tell what do you propose, to, how do you propose to classify the gliomas from now on? But certainly, uh, uh, you know, the information that we publish now should be incorporated into the clinical setting, but uh, again, I mean, uh, uh, what we were saying before remains the main challenge. I mean, uh, unfortunately, the clinical setting requires uh, um, information that have to be much more simplified, much more uh, directly as accessible by, by the clinical people. And uh, that remains the main challenge. The main challenge is how do we translate the complexity of this information into something that is very simple. And, and unfortunately, uh, this is not immediately obvious. But are you trying to do it already? Yes, yes, of course. I mean, we hope that there will be a follow up. But, you know, I mean, uh, um, for example, I am right now directing uh, a clinical trial in Europe that uh, involves many different centers uh, uh, all uh, over Europe. And uh, I actually visited the recently, uh, I don't think I met you, but I was uh, in Ribeirão. Are you in Ribeirão or in Sao Paulo? I am in Sao Paulo right now, but I have been to Ribeirão last week. Okay, so I visited uh, there. I don't know if uh, Hutan told you, but I was there last month. Um, you know, I came uh, to give a conference there, um, and uh, I am trying to uh, bring together, in fact, uh, uh, institutions from all over the world to uh, try to do exactly the right uh, uh, thing, uh, the, to use the right approach for patients with brain tumors. Uh, uh, for example, trying to classify these tumors in the proper way. But again, it's a very, very difficult proposition in the absence of a unified center uh, that has the resources and the organization to do that. I mean, these are very difficult studies, as I said, uh, require a lot of financial support as well as organizational support. So the ability to translate these studies into the clinic um, is a challenge. It's not simple. And, uh, you know, if we don't have uh, a, an attention uh, from the public that recognizes the importance, uh, for example, just to give you an idea, that there are many uh, breast cancer uh, research centers that have been created around the world, very, very highly integrated, where you have scientists and physicians working together Better. This is uh, almost never happening for brain tumors. If we don't create that type of high-profile uh, institutions that, that uh, become uh, really hubs for translational research in brain tumors, we cannot expect that then the most uh, uh, valuable and um, exceptional research uh, is uh, translated into the clinical setting. The, Neuro-oncology clinical setting uh, is uh, currently uh, very much backward compared with other clinical oncology areas. Let's hope it changes with this article, so, right? <laughs> as you know, clearly one of the 
aim I have to say very unsuccessful aim of my job today is uh, to increase uh, awareness in the public uh, to try to build uh, you know uh, in anywhere in the world you know a major uh, highly ambitious uh, uh, institute infrastructure to do just that I think that uh, until we uh, really uh, uh, don't change the pace uh, to which we work and uh, until we don't change the aim of our work. Uh, unfortunately, this is, is not going to happen uh, on its own. I'm going to make a, a question again about the how did you treat a patient before and after the molecular studies? Not exactly how did you treat, but if you if you compare the way you had to do it in 99, for instance, and the yeah. way you have to, you could potentially do now if this all these exams are available to right. person to person treatment can you say that before you had only an R, uh, mra image and is it correct in english mra mri mri <laughs> mri yeah uh, image and the histopathological laminas and now you have can you compare these two sets of information that is currently being used now the histopathological way, and the one that, that could be have... used in the future so f f first of all i have to re-emphasize that today unfortunately like before, before these tumors are not cured okay so you have to separate the reality on the ground, what happens in the clinic, what happens when a patient gets a brain tumor and goes to a clinic, okay? Most of the times these patients are not cured, okay? Unfortunately, this is not different from what was happening before. So we haven't changed the clinical outcome of these patients today, okay? If somebody gets sick today, it, it is unfortunately not the so substantially different than it was uh, 20 years ago, okay? What is uh, dramatically different is the knowledge that we have available. But again, what I was saying before and that I repeat, uh, the knowledge is not being used to treat patients, okay? Because in order to do that, you need the major financial and organizational infrastructure. The, this is not there. So, of course, you know, we can use some information to understand better what is in the tumor of these patients, but uh, uh, we need much more sophisticated uh, studies. We need many more tools, like, for example, uh, uh, we need to be able to understand if the drugs that we predict as the possible targeting drugs for a patient tumor actually work or not. We don't know that. So sometimes, you know, today in the clinic, you can actually um, quite easily understand if there are some genetic alteration in a patient tumor. But then this is not not sufficient because uh, the drug that then can be used uh, uh, still most of the times uh, don't work. So what we need to do, for example, but this is just one thing, you know, there are really many other things that we should be doing, is uh, to take the tumor from this patient, establish uh, what we call a tumor avatar. Hmm? That means the fact that the tumor is grown outside of the patient, is grown in the lab or in the mouse, okay? And now you can give the drugs that come out of the genetic and epigenetic analysis to ask if those drugs work. So okay? nowadays we don't have a mo an, an animal model to gliomas. Well, we do, we do have. We have many animal models that can be used. But the best animal model model is the model that come from any patient tumor. So if there is a patient A, there should be animal model for patient A. If there is a patient B, there should animal, be animal model for patient B and uh, patient C. Each patient different model. To do that, you need big infrastructure.
structure, big organization and big money. It's not there. Nobody does that. I understand. That's but why it's frustrating. All of these things could be done immediately, but are not done because there is no money and there is no participation of a scientist like Hutan, like myself, in the clinical decisions. The clinical decisions today are still made by clinicians that want everything very easy and very simple. It doesn't work like that. It's not simple and easy. So just to, um, uh, just to try to engage people on these uh, fundings and everything, can you just say what could be done and what results it could, could be achieved if you had this this funding? Yeah, but just I already told you, actually. I mean, no, no, uh, I know, but but for instance, uh, yeah. you can say for instance, uh, if we had this these investments, we could be right. able to treat each patient in his particular way. We could improve quality of life, or you could even yeah. think of a cure. What what are these these achievements would lead uh, to? Oh, re re Research means that you don't know what uh, you get when you do that research, okay? So everything I tell you, of course, uh, is not something that we do tomorrow and now we cure everybody. It doesn't work like that, okay? What I told you is that for every patient, we need a different study, a personalized study where for every patient we study the genetic, the epigenetic, and the model of the tumor and the drug sensitivity for every patient. Now, what, what will happen after we do that? I don't know. I cannot tell you. I know that this is the right thing to do. I, I am sure that some patients will receive a benefit, a better benefit from accurate and depth analysis. I don't know how many patients will be cured. I don't know if we will cure one patient or if we will cure one million patients. I cannot tell you because this is something that has not been done so far. Great. That, that's exactly what we treat about. We talk about the limits of the science as but, well in our material. That's why I'm forcing the this question. The frustration you know, of uh, what we call uh, translational science and the transitional research uh, like us uh, is that uh, we feel that all of these uh, um, all of these uh, uh, tools uh, that are currently available uh, are not uh, used properly to treat patients at this moment great can you uh, can you uh make uh, the big picture of this new classification you are proposing in this paper for instance, ah, we create, we found two groups that are escapers from the previous classification. Uh, Can you give us this big picture? Yeah, yeah, that's very important because you know the previous classification included this group, uh, uh, these small groups that we identified into very big groups. So, for example, there was a big group that was called the uh, SIMP, uh, that is the group that is characterized by high methylation. And now we know that this group is actually separated into two subgroups. One is exactly what uh, we knew before, but then there is another group that is actually characterized by a much worse uh, um, clinical outcome. So this is, a, again, a very important information, and uh, we hope to follow up also with the understanding of why this happens, that, of course, now we don't know. So. Um, it's, it's actually a way to basically uh, understand much better what the, these groups are. In the case of the G-SYNC high and G-SYNC low, mm -hmm. we would, uh, if you look at this group, we use it to see them as low-grade uh, gliomas or glioblastomas. Right, both. They are all together. The uh, yes, I mean, they have these... Uh, different methylation feature and uh, they are uh, this uh, difference of high and low is present both in the low-grade glioma and in the glioblastoma. 
So we can separate, you know, within the low grade glioma, those with high and those with low. And within the glioblastoma, we can also do the same thing, separate those with high and those with low. So this classification doesn't uh, stay limited to the low glioblastoma, low grade exactly. gliomas, and to the high grade. It uh, includes all, all of the glioma, both the low grade and the uh, glioblastoma. They are all put together. And this uh, uh, molecular analysis that we do, these molecular discoveries that we make, go across the board. So include uh, everything. So clearly they are uh, appropriate. Uh, they should be used both for patients with glioblastoma and for low-grade glioma. Can we say that some low-grade glioma patients have a profile that looks more similar to the glioblastomas, for instance, when you see uh, the molecular profile? Absolutely, and that's exactly one of the main outcome of uh, the study. That's exactly why, I mean, uh, these uh, molecular alterations concern a bot. Because even though from uh, the histological standpoint, you can call a tumor uh, uh, LGG, low-grade glioma, then that tumor, if it, it has uh, this uh, G-simple low, um, is much more aggressive. It's much more similar uh, to a glioblastoma, exactly like uh, if uh, that tumor uh, has, uh, for example, an IDH wild type. That is another feature uh, that makes uh, these uh, tumors uh, very aggressive. So we have now number of features. It's not just one thing. It's not just the g pi or g low. It's also the status of IDH that is very important. It's also the status of the expression signature that is very, very important. There are clearly many informations that uh, we have uh, uh, dissected in these papers. And then when all of them come together, only when all of them are available for that patient, we can give the best prediction for the clinical outcome of that patient and, uh, you know, how aggressive the tumor is. So the simple definition of low-grade glioma or glioblastoma by itself is not sufficient. Uh, what we do in this paper is to provide a, a much more complicated set of dissection of molecular dissection of the tumor. And, oops, sorry. Uh, <coughs> should this new classification replace the histological one or be no, no, looked no. together? Should, of course, be integrated, not replaced. There is nothing that should be uh, taken away. The point here is not to take away anything. The point here is to bring in. Uh, the problem is to bring in, to, to, to add, to include additional information. So uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the issue remains that, uh, as I said, the inclusion of uh, this type of highly sophisticated information is very, very difficult. I mean, I can bet that no no one single patient in Brazil, for sure, uh, but most likely also in the United States, uh, receives uh, all of the information that are in this paper. You, you said in the beginning that it was a huge effort. I'd like to ask, is it possible that just one <laughs> laboratory or one research center uh, no. can do all this work, all this research? Um, it can. in. A in a, first of all, it depends if you talk about one lab or one research center. In our research center, there are probably 200 labs. So in a research center, yes. In one lab, no. But what is the advantage of doing it spread around the world as you did? There is no advantage at all. In fact, <laughs> there is only disadvantage. If you could do it in one one same place it would be fantastic, but of course, no one same place can do it at the moment. Oh, so that's a limitation of knowledge and people being in the oh. same place. I mean, the reason why we have put together people 
from all over the world because each of us brings a different expertise that of course is not available in only one place but if we were all of us in the same place it would be much better it would be much easier and how in so how did you communicate with everyone how could people share Just information we are communicating with you i mean uh, we do teleconference we do video conference we exchange uh, uh, information through servers uh, you know through emails <laughs> so you accomplished to join a great deal of people in the same study absolutely absolutely but clearly Again, Anna, you really have to understand that the purpose of this was to do a research project. The goal of this was not to treat patients. Mm -hmm. That's why, I mean, uh, you know, you have to understand that the level of complexity uh, when you want to translate this into the clinical setting is much higher. <clears throat> What about specifically the University of São Paulo participation? Uh, do you think it was relevant? Was it relevant? Of course, very, very important. Did you speak to Hutan? Yes, but I would like to see in your point of view why University of São Paulo was important in this study. But, you know, uh, you have to understand that the universities uh, matter because there are people, okay, because there are scientists and there are doctors. So, so in this particular case, the University of San Paulo participated in this work because there is the group of Hutan. And the group of Hutan um, has uh, some important expertise in the analysis of uh, epigenetics and DNA methylation. That's what they primarily did. That's what they contributed to this paper. Uh, so uh, their contribution has been as absolutely essential, just like the contribution from the other crucial groups. This was really <clears throat> a paper done by uh, three main groups, one from the University of Sao Paulo with the group of Hutan, one from uh, the uh, Institute in uh, Houston, MD Anderson, uh, where the leader was uh, Roel Verak. Will, will you interview him? Probably. And the last one by ourselves here at Columbia that uh, has been directed by myself. So this has been an exceptional uh, integrated uh, work by very highly talented uh, uh, group of investigators that are actually highly specialized in different areas. So. The group of Hutan is uh, specialized, as we said, in epigenetics and methylation. The group of uh, Royal Verac is uh, primarily specialized in the genetics, in uh, how these uh, genetic alterations are important. And our cells are uh, specialized in uh, uh, gene expression and, of course, in the biology of the disease. Of, of, uh, how important uh, we can uh, translate uh, this uh, information, how reliably we can translate uh, this information into real features of the clinical disease. So, uh, you know, probably I am the only one in the group that uh, has treated actually patients with brain tumors. So, uh that's a good reason why I asked this question. In these 40 years of treatments, clinic clinics and researches that have been done, have you seen any discovery that that important to treat gliomas? Yes, yes, absolutely. Many, many discoveries. Oh. Uh, uh, but as I said, I mean, you know, um, I understand that, that it may be very complicated, uh, but uh, unfortunately, you don't have one discovery, one treatment. It doesn't work like that. You need many, many more um, uh, uh, settings and infrastructure to tra translate that discovery into the treatment. And how big was the step that you just made right now publishing this paper on cell? It's very big because it provides the, the basic information on which to 
build then a potential treatment. But uh, if we don't do the type of things that I told you before, the treatment is not obvious. It's not that now we publish this paper and patients will be cured. That's not what is going to happen, okay? So we need major uh, scientific and uh, medical infrastructure to translate this information into the clinical setting. Perfect. Do you want to add anything else? I think it was a really I good interview. Much everything. And of course, you know, if you want to talk to me again, uh, I will be delighted. Uh, you know, if you have additional questions in the future, I will be delighted to talk to you. Thank you very much. You are very yeah. nice to treating us. <laughs> and I hope to hear from you soon. We probably yes. talk a little bit more because I need the contact of the Columbia University Press Office it's and other a, things. I'll send and uh, uh, I'll send you an email uh, uh, today with all the contacts. And uh, uh, I hope that uh, the, we will be able to see. I mean, uh, I think also from the conversation, you probably perceived that some degree of frustration. I really feel very much that uh, we are much more advanced in terms of uh, knowledge now compared to what uh, is actually done in the clinic. Uh, 